Hello and welcome to Close Calls on the 42.e brought to you in association with Air Sport. My own name is Gavin Casey. You know the scale at this stage. Every week, every Friday, we look ahead to the biggest sporting event of the weekend and we dial up the hottest pundits in the game to help us through it. Um, I suppose it's been a week dominated by arm wrestles between Ireland and our good friends across the Irish Sea and hostilities are set to recommence this weekend as three of the Irish provinces take on Premiership opposition. Here to talk me through those games is former Ireland head coach. Eddie O'Sullivan, Eddie, how are things? Good times, Gav. Uh, we might kick off before we look at the uh, the three fixtures for the Irish lads. Just um, it's kind of silly season, really. The last couple of maybe ten days, week or so, transfer rumours, a couple of moves confirmed as well. Jordy Murphy gone to Ulster. Uh, I think much of it has been dominated by uh, suggestions that Peter Romani and CJ Sander might be might have one foot out the door at Munster and um, you'd kind of wonder, given that these were supposed to be the lads that would be kind of steering the ship as uh, Johan van Graan came in, will it be a distraction for Munster this weekend? What, what do you make of it all? And we might start with Omani. I mean, he's so integral to, I think, um, yeah. most Munster's sort of rugby culture and their, their identity down there. He'd be an absolutely massive loss. Well, it'll be a huge loss when you consider that Dunnick Ryan has gone and um, Simon Zebo's halfway out the door. Like, O'Mahony to follow him would be, would be probably catastrophic, isn't too small a word to use. Um, and I think um, it seems to be the, that they're in the bargaining stages between uh, the, what's the detail of the contract. There's two dimensions to most contracts. One is the actual the money side of it, what we paid per annum, and the other one is the, um, the tenure of it, whether it's one, two, or three-year contract. Um, I know with Donna Ryan it wasn't so much the money, it was the, the tenure, I think it was, for him it was offered a one year in one story, you know, a fellow his age would probably want more security in that, mm. <clears throat> that didn't materialise, I'm not sure what, what, why Simon Zebo went, but Peter O'Mahony is, is obviously at loggerheads at the moment because it's become public, um, I think the problem is that they seem to be using a system in the RFU, which is nothing wrong with it, it's kind of a metric for putting a value on a player based on the work rate, the number of games they play, the match time, the work rate and all that. And there's a way of doing that. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's done in the NFL, it's done in baseball, it's done in the NBA. But I suppose there's no metric um, for other aspects like tactical notes, leadership and charisma. And mm-hmm. um, you talk about Mahoney, they're the things you talk about a lot. His, his leadership qualities, you know, his, his kind of, his gravitas within the Munster team. And the Irish team, in fact, when he's there, you know. I mean, he was the key to beating England last year in the Six Nations, even though he wasn't even picked to start. He got in and the whole thing changed. So I, I think you can't put a metric on those things. And for that reason, that's why he's so important to Munster. In the context of Ireland, I suppose there's so many good back rows around. And the fact that he wasn't even in the shake-up at the end of last year, Six Nations, you know, he probably is in the food chain somewhere in the Irish back row. But um, the Irish, you might not see him as critical going forward uh, in terms of, laying out a lot of, of, of money and our tenure to him, whereas Munster see him as vital for obvious reasons. And that is the conundrum at the moment. Um, can Munster get the RFU to see the value of Omani uh, in the way they see him? And I, one would hope that there's a bit of a dance involved here with all these negotiations and eventually it comes to a conclusion and he says, I think the guy wants to stay, everybody wants him to stay, and you'd be hopeful that it get done. But if he were to go, I think it would be a catastrophic is a good word. And then CJ Stander will be another huge loss. Um, he's a guy on one street as well, but he seems to be further up the, the pecking order in Ireland. So maybe maybe that's not as, as, as dangerous as it seems. But although the money in France is huge, um, Montpellier have a bottomless pit there mm. and they're well able to spend it. So maybe it's just down to that in the end of the day. But those two players, yeah, will be would be disastrous for Munster. Absolutely. Like, I know for a fact that Peter Romani, this isn't the first time, obviously, he's had offers from abroad. Like, it, it, it is the first time he's gone public with it, and therefore you maybe hope, I suppose, that it is a dance, as you mentioned. Like, say, going back, it would have been two, three years ago, I think Toulouse offered a double his salary on two occasions, and he stayed on the basis that he wanted to captain Munster. Whereas this time, like... What I heard about that was that he felt shafted by the IRFU offer, but kind of swallowed his pride because of, I suppose, his pride for his province. This time, maybe, you know, you're talking about a short career. He's got a kid now. Things are a little bit different. Money is obviously important. Um, Stander, yeah, as you mentioned, he, he seems to be more, slightly more integral to the Irish setup, or, or um, as, uh, yeah, as you say, higher up the, the pecking order. And it also seems to be one where... 
It does, yeah. He's probably not. It's probably not as big of a risk of him departing. Like I suppose there's been less talk of it, and there's interest from Montpellier, whereas there are definitely concrete offers for Romani that he's obviously going to consider. Yeah, I think as well, Omani would be, maybe he stayed the last time he looked at the balance. You have to remember the players as well, apart from a contract, they've got a value off the field. And, and they do sit down and, and crunch the numbers. Um, but for, for Omani to leave now, it, it would probably mean that, I suppose, Munster would find him very hard to replace him. Like they very found it very hard to replace Donald like Ryan. You know, these guys, because they're just very good players, but they're also kind of the glue that sticks the team together because of the way they play and the way they lead. Um, CJ Standard, not to the same degree, I think, and that's not taking away from his performances. Maybe, you know, he's he's not the same spiritual type of leader that Romani is in that group. Um, but I think he is seen probably further up the, the depth chart than, than Peter Romani is in terms of cover and stuff. And for that reason, I suppose, he might have a better chance of keeping him. But as I said, it might come if it comes down to money, and it's a case that Montpellier, who seemed to have plenty of it, just put put a big enough offer on the table. You know, the player has to think of himself and his family as well. Um, and that applies to both of them. Uh, so, like, the only thing that little worries me a little about the Peter Romani scenario is that he has put out a deadline. And you hate to see deadlines going out in negotiations because that means that it's coming to a crunch point. And he has put the new year, that's before the six, which really means before the Six Nations. Mm. Something has to be done in his head. Um, and I think that deadline that he set... Um, is probably a sign that the negotiations are a little more fraught than, than most people would expect it. But look, we're, it's all speculation, really, and hopefully they would keep both of them, and certainly Omani, to me, in terms of the, his his leadership qualities, his gravitas, his charisma, his his uh, his importance to Munster, um, he's probably crucial for Munster more than Anton. Absolutely, yeah. My understanding of it is that it's uh, Toulon and Leicester in for Romani at the moment, and obviously Munster playing Leicester tomorrow could be pretty interesting. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, in terms of transfers, potential transfers the other way, uh, there has been suggestions in the Irish Times again, the Irish Times are all over these at the moment, that uh, Tiernan O'Halloran might be viewed as a potential replacement for Simon Zebo. I don't know what you make of that potential move, Eddie, but I can't help but wonder... If Munster already kind of have a natural replacement in Andrew Conway, given his form, well, well Conway's been outstanding. He's played international level, so you know how, how, how much better can you get? And, and he's a guy that's getting better every season, and he's he's flexible in the back three. But I suppose maybe O'Halloran would be maybe leaning that way himself because he feels that um, Munster are probably going to be regularly in Europe. Connacht might struggle to, to fit that bill. Um, and he probably sees that playing in the in the in the European Champions Cup as as a, as, a, um, uh, as probably a bigger stage. And Connacht kind of might get there yet, but they've, they've this season they've they haven't they've got to win this season to get into the, the European Cup. And their form in, in the Pro 14 hasn't been outstanding. You know they're they're languishing outside the playoffs, and it doesn't seem to be changing at the moment. There's something changes dramatically after Christmas. So he's probably looking at it in terms of his career. He struggled to break into Ireland. That's another issue for him. He's been unlucky not to be there, but he's been there. He's 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 tasted Irish camp, Irish international duty. He wants to get back there, or maybe he feels that he has to go to Munster, maybe to make his case. So there are all the things that, that we're speculating on that's going on in his head. But he certainly would see himself as a, as a replacement for Zebo. And if Munster see him as a potential guy as well, that's going to boss about back three because he can play in the wing mm-hmm. as well, and more than Conway, it's another string to Munster's bow. So. Um, it's a distinct possibility that could happen. And I suppose, look, if he's going to move, and I won't make many friends call me for this, but if he's going to move, um, it's better he moves in, in Ireland, like Jordy Murphy is, rather than the potential of someone like Peter Romani or, 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 um, or CJ Standard moving out of the country altogether. Um, so I think it's not it's not ideal. Uh, but if he sees his future in Munster and he thinks he's better opportunities to play for Ireland there, at least he's still in the country. Absolutely, yeah. Well, we uh, might kick off with Munster and Leicester then uh, tomorrow evening. I suspect I know the answer to this question, but this sort of speculation that we've just mentioned with two of these key players and part of that core leadership, is it a distraction at all ahead of this? Mass- what well, is a massive game for, for Munster? It's really down to the players themselves individually, you know. And Peter Mann is a very emotional guy, you know. like that's, he's, a, he's a kind of a heart in a sleeve type of character on and off hmm. the field. Uh, which kind of makes him the charismatic character he is. Um, 
but you'd like to think he could shut it out, but it's very hard to, uh, particularly, you know, if one of those teams that are in, in the bidding from <laughs> might be played against them, you know, it doesn't make it any easier. But, you, you know, I think he will, you know, the, the guy's a professional player, but there's all, it's always at the back of your mind. And it's the same for every player when you're coming up to contract negotiations. They say things like, oh, it's up to the agents, it's up to where if you, it's up to them to deal with it. But it's floating in the back of your head because the truth of the matter is, uh, if you play badly over a period of time, it doesn't help your share value. And if you pick up an injury, it can be a disaster. You know, so um, when you're in those kind of the throes of those negotiations and you're trying to play, it is it does make life more difficult. There's nothing like the feeling that your contract signed, sealed, or delivered. You pitch up to training and it's onwards and upwards. But a man is a he's a tough guy and he's very passionate. I, I don't see him taking this step any other direction or even forward tomorrow uh, in in a red shirt. But it doesn't make life a little more difficult for him. There's no doubt about that. And it's hard to imagine it won't be floating in the back of his head somewhere. Uh, but I can't imagine he'll let it affect his performance. Absolutely. What have you made of uh, Van Grant's induction thus far? Have you noticed any changes in Munster's approach? Like, obviously, some talk from Conor Murray and others has been, you know, let's not change anything too drastically. It's, you know, pretty much the middle of the season at this stage. What have you um, seen in his uh, start so far? Nothing much really any different, you know. I mean, the, the problem for Munster is the opposition they face in that transition. If you couldn't pick a better transition phase, like they've played, basically played the Dragons, they've played, um, I think, just Zebra, and they've played, the um, well. you know, the Ospreys, like, who are roofed at the bottom of their con- conferences in, in the league. So that they weren't playing any major opposition. I mean, I thought the Ospreys, Ospreys were appalling, uh, especially without the ball, which is a big problem for defence. Um, and, you know, Munster got it almost too easy last weekend. Um, so they don't know where they stand, really. They haven't really had a good kind of a, a barnstormer of a game against good opposition to set them up for this. So, you know, and they've got their injury problems as well. But it's hard. I don't see anything that Van Grand has changed. He couldn't. Like, he's only in there a wet weekend, yeah. literally. Um, uh, so the talk of, the only thing I would say, the talk of keeping things the same is a little bit of a concern because we know Munster have have to evolve and last year they, they got a long way down the track playing their old style attritional game and they were very good at it they got to play Saracens and Finetley and then the wheels came off at the, at the business end of the season and we all talked about you know this is um, Erasmus first season given a chance to bed in get his set out his stall but he had to move things on this year and you'd like to think that Van Gran is going to move things on this year now it's hard to ask him to do it yet but that's the next step for them can they evolve into a more expansive team because we know what the players they have that they're, they're not going to break down the, 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 the door at the end of the season the playoffs if they go back to type you know that's we know that but that's the big thing to look for now I, I don't think he'll get anything done in the meantime but when they're talking about not changing things you just wonder is it more of the same and I don't think if Munster want to progress it can be more of the same for them they've got to exp- expand their game and that would have been the plan I expect with Erasmus had he been around, but he's not now. So you'd like to think himself and Van Grand know each other very well. They've talked extensively. Uh, he would have told Van Grand the plan he had in mind, the best way to go about it in his view, and Van Grand would be taking that philosophy forward. He may do it slightly differently, but that's not the point. The point is that Munster must evolve. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, like, I suppose whatever about changing approach so far, as you mentioned, he hasn't had a chance. He, he hasn't been shy in making changes to the team. Three European debutants tomorrow, or at least, um, well, two European debutants, I think. Uh, young Arnold played for Ulster in a European game maybe early last year. Uh, but a big opportunity for the likes of Wharton. We've seen what uh, Clota is about now. He's a bit of a tank. How do you reckon they're going to get on? Yeah. Um, I think the, the two packs will slug it out. It'll be, you know, it'll be tough up front, but I wouldn't, be hard to separate the two packs. I think it comes down to the halfbacks, um, and I think um, for that Murray's going to be the key. Murray and Ben Youngs, that's going to be a great old scrap, you know. And um, Keatley holds his form. He's playing really well. It's probably his best rugby at the moment for Munster he's played. He's up against uh, George Ford, who's a very able operator. Again, Ford's form can come and go, but I, I think it comes to the halfbacks. If the halfback battle is won by Munster, they win the game because whoever wins the halfback battle is going to control the field position and possibly possession, and if Munster get in the right parts of the field uh, for long enough and often enough, I think they should be able to get it done. Uh, but I can't imagine there'll be much in it. I, I know that if you look at Le- Leicester, they're in transition as well a little bit. Um, you know, um, they, they, they're, 
Devin O'Kosh there as well, uh, who won't who won't be any stranger to to Tolman Park, um, having having coached uh, Leinster. Um, but I think, having said that, I think it really still comes back to the halfbacks at the end of the day. Well, uh, we'll move on then. So to the Ulster men, uh, like it's kind of an opportunity for us to get back into the mix in this group. I think against Harlequins, I know they're away, and you know traditionally it's going to be a, a tricky tie. But Quinns not in the best of form. Obviously, they had a big enough win against Saris last time out, but they uh, had two heavy defeats before that, and they're already kind of out of the pool as well, which I think is important. Yeah, this is a funny one to call because both teams are vulnerable at the moment. Like Harlequins haven't been firing on all cylinders. They they did a smash and grab last weekend against Saracens. That will give them a bit of a, a boost uh, coming into training this week. But Ulster are struggling as well. They're they're again it's the Ulster but also just lack of consistency. You know, they've they've struggled against weaker teams. They should be imposing themselves. Like it's you know the dogs in the street in in, in, in Belfast are talking about Ulster's inability to put kind of performances back to back and they have a very good team you know and it's it comes down to like if they get in the front foot against Harlequins all the way from home and they feel a fan who's a really good distributor but they need to get the ball in the hands of Stockdale, Pieto and and I suppose um, uh, McCluskey really they've been the guys that have been tearing it up for them um, and but the worry for Ulster is that their confidence is rattled when things go well it's great, but if they hit a wobble at all, they tend to go into themselves. And away from home, um, I just don't know what to expect from them. You know, I, I, they could easily go out and win the game on uh, on the weekend and win it comfortably if they hit the straps. But they have been failing to do that. They have the horses for it, but they have been failing to do it. And you just don't know what to expect from them. Um, and I think Harlequins are vulnerable, so you'd like to think they will get it done. But I just give, I've given up predicting what Ulster will, will do. You know, it's it's very difficult. Like, they're, they're, they must have the most patient fans in the world because they they have promised so much and delivered so little and it's it's been ongoing for seasons now and this season has been no different than the last two or three and they've you know they've they have the, they have the they have fantastic players and they've like they've had a couple of injuries but like everybody has them at this stage of the season but they definitely need to find a way to get Pieto Stockdale and Gilroy's back now is another great striker Tommy Ball like I think look at the selection in the back line. The best case is rolling the dice here and gone for a run and gun game. Because Pito, Gilroy, Bo, McCluskey, Stockdale uh, are all, you know, line breakers really. And Leela Fano was a distributor. And Cooney's been incredibly solid for him. It's been a really smart kind of. Um, There's another guy who's moved from one yeah. province to another. Cooney's moved to Ulster has been huge. And um, we see Jordy Murphy following him this week. But I haven't said that in terms of the context of the game. I think if Ulster play well, they'll win. And if they don't play well, they'll probably lose. It's, it's kind of a stupid anal- analogy, but it's down to Ulster's del- delivery, and I, I don't know if they will or not. Uh, how important do you reckon is uh, Rory Best's absence going to be? Obviously, Ian Henderson deputising as captain. Like, and you met, you're mentioning his ball carriers, Henderson would be one of them for sure. Like, I think he is this sort of penchant for having three phenomenal games in a row and then having one very quiet game. I thought, say, for example, against Argentina, he was maybe our weakest forward in terms of his contribution, and it's not something you'd say about him often, but he, he needs to obviously stand up as a as a proper leader again tomorrow. Or Sunday, sorry. He will, yeah. yeah, He will, and, and Rory Best is a loss on the leadership front, because Rob Herring has been playing well. Um, he's a very good hooker, but Rory brings that kind of leadership quality that you know they do need at the moment. They need somebody to kind of tie them together as a group and keep their nose, all their noses pointing in the same direction. When they they will in every game, there's moments when things can go wrong or they go wrong. And you've got to get everybody pointing in the same direction, and Ulster will need that in Spades on Sunday. You know because they they have been a time that well they've been all season they've been struggling to kind of find a kind of cohesive pattern to their game. And you're right, Henderson now will probably step into that role. Um, in terms of trying to get everybody together, um, and as captain, it's it's a big ask for him because he's not that experienced, mm-hmm. really. You know, I mean, he's kind of he, we think he is because he's played so much, but he's he's young enough. But at the same time, he would have a lot of gravitas. He's playing out of position now because remember his position now is lock, even though he's played back row. Um, his position is lock, but you'd like to think that with his experience and his ability. Um, he should be able to get people going in the same direction. But I, I, I hopefully it doesn't fall on his shoulders alone. It takes more than one guy. I and mean, Tommy Bowe is very experienced as well. Um, he's a guy who's, who's as much experience as you'd want. He needs going to play a part in that as well. 
But um, Henderson has a lot of pressure on him. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he goes. You know, I think yeah, he was quite enough at times in the autumn. But we know his capacity to step up and and going down from test level to European level, he should be able to make an impact and it would be very important he does. Absolutely. Well, uh, rounding off the weekend, Leinster visit Exeter. Exeter back on top of the uh, Premiership table. How good are they, Eddie, do you reckon? Obviously, the last couple of years has been this resounding success for them. You speak very highly of uh, their coach, uh, Rob Baxter, who you do, you compared with Bill Belichick, I think, on Off the Ball during the week. Um, the, uh, yeah. what, what, I wonder, like, is it almost is he almost a sort of a Billy Bean figure in that? Like, a lot of the players, the Exeter players, say for example uh, Garrett Steenson at 10, he, like, he, this was an outcast from Ulster, he was released 11 years ago and he's doing, he's working magic there, you know, like it, it seems to be almost like a money ball thing they have going, but um, how good are they? No, it, they are very good, it's not a money ball thing actually, it's that it's Baxter's kind of footprint on the right. team, and the sense that Baxter is, is you know, a bit like Leo Cullen, like he's he's a, he's Leo's a Leinster man. You know, died in the wool. He played for Leinster, captain Leinster. Uh, back to the same at Exeter, like he's died in the wool. Yeah, he played for well. him for 10, 10, 12 years, I think, didn't he? Yeah, well, he played I think fourteen right. years, and he was captain, captain for ten, 10 of them. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much that's pretty much locked in syndrome as a, as a, as a yeah. player, you know. And for that, but he he's his style of rugby is it, it's all about culture for Baxter. What I can tell. I've only spoken to him once uh, on the phone about something completely different. But if you look at his whole body language, the way he talks, he's very understated. You know, he, he doesn't exaggerate. You can imagine playing from that. You would have to go to war every week, 110% from to get into that team. And if you look at the teams he picks, he picks teams, or he picks players that aren't really that high profile. He's got a sprinkling of guys who are high profile. But I would guarantee you, most people would struggle to name more than five of the extra starting 15 on, on the weekend. You just wouldn't know them. But they are incredibly tough, rugged, hard-working uh, team that no frills. They play a very attritional game. That's the way Baxter calls That's his style of, of rugby. Nothing wrong with it when you do it well. And um, it's got them to the top of the Viva Premiership. This is a work in progress for, for Exeter because the owner, again, has backed Baxter the whole way and they're probably one of the most successful clubs in England based on finances alone. They, they don't lose money. They don't spend um, you know, recklessly on, on, on high-profile players. If you come in, no matter who you are, everybody toes the same line. And um, they play like that. So they're a very hard team to beat because they're so tight as a unit. They're so tight as a, as a group. And um, that Baxter defines that. So for Leinster, who have buckets of talent, Leinster... I think um, 19 internationals on deck on the weekend out of 23. It's not bad way to pick a team when you've got 19 internationals. And they have the talent, they have the ability, they have the experience. Um, but they will have to be, they'll have to play out their socks, I think, to get out of, of uh, Sandy Park with a, with a win. And they might need a yeah. win. You know, you get out of Sandy Park with a losing bonus point and then focus on getting a result next week in Dublin. That could be the difference. Because to be fair to Leinster, like they've got the raw end of the deal here in terms of pools you know they've got a shockingly difficult pool it is the pool of death yeah. I think they've made the best and, possible start of course you know, 10 points they have a core and yeah that's why that's in their favour If they, I think they'll be going to to Exeter and saying look let's go and try and win here you're never going to a game not trying to win but if if we get a bonus point out of it it'll be a pretty good innings uh, on, on Sunday and um, it'll be about overcoming Exeter their spirit, their, their their aggression, the way they play. If Leinster aren't up for that, if Leinster can't meet that head on, uh, it'll, it could be difficult to hear from. If they do, if Leinster meet that head on, they have the players to potentially beat Exeter. And they've got to go there believing that. But the first box to tick on on Sunday for, Le- for Leinster is to, they have got to meet Exeter head on in, in the physicality department. And then it starts from there. You do that, now you're in the game. Um, and I think for that reason, that's the biggest challenge on the weekend. And I think it's kind of like Leo Cullen getting into the Leinster players' heads and making sure that they're ready for that onslaught because Baxter will have his boys. Because to t- top it off, like the, 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 the two list for, for extra chases was one to win the Viva Premiership. They've done mm. that. No, they're thinking Europe. Like the Exeter are thinking Europe. Um, they're still thinking the Viva Premiership, but they've got that monkey off their back. And they're still top of the league, but I know their owner uh, is thinking we could take Europe if we get a good run at it. And look, Leinster are next on the menu. That doesn't mean Leinster 
or no, only making up the numbers, Leinster are more than capable of beating Exeter, but they're going to have to play really, really well. But first, they're going to have to stop Exeter playing, and that's uh, that's probably the toughest task. Any qualms with the decision not to register uh, James Lowe for this weekend? I suppose necessities kind of took priority in a sense with uh, Gibson Park yeah. and Fardy. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was just the numbers they had to cover themselves as scrum half and they had to cover themselves in the back five. So he was the one that lost out. It's not like they're stuck for no. options, you know, in, in their back three. Like they have, a, they, have a, they have a serious log jam in their back three. That's why I think just question Lowe coming in at all as he needed. Like They've got Massey, McFadden, Adam Byrne, Barry Daly, and then young guys like Larmore, Jack Kelly, Ian Fitzpatrick, Hugo Keenan. You just wonder what those guys are thinking. Like, when are we going to get to play for Leinster when James Law has been trumpeted in like as, as the next big the big uh, back three player, you know? So it's 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 um it's an embarrassment of riches. Um and you just wonder if they needed James Law and they're not going to use him now, but I don't think the world ends for them because they don't have James Law. Um so I I, I think He's not going to be missed that much with the talent they have. I'm not saying he isn't a good player, but there's plenty of talent in that back three without James Law in the mix. Absolutely. Well, I might uh, ask you for a prediction for Leinster there, and we'll round up uh, the other two as well. Uh, I'd like. I, I'd. I'd probably say realistically for Leinster, they got a losing bonus point. Um, and if they're if you're in one score with ten minutes to go, you could nick it. But I think that will be a good day's work for them. Get extra back into the into into Dublin with a chance of beating them. Um, Munster, I think Munster will do it at home. I think the halfbacks, particularly Murray, will probably be the key guy, and of course, probably O'Mahony will probably have a bar stormer, you know, because there's so much on the table. Putting himself you know, in the shop does. window, is he? Yeah, <laughs> I well, know, I, think, no, I think he, I think he does it because it's a, he's wearing a red yeah, shirt, yeah. you know. Um, that's just him. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think I'll start. You don't, don't need to know. make a call on that one. You've already. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think they're more than capable of it, but will they? I think they're. The thing worries me is they're they're so f- um, they, they look so fr- mentally fragile at the moment as a team um, that if things go wrong, they, they, they might not get out the other yeah. side of it. But things go well, they could kick on. You know, they need they need a game where things go well from for eighty minutes. Yeah. So in another, in other words, they are very much still Ulster. Eddie, thanks a million for joining us, and we'll speak to you soon. Enjoy the games over the weekend. Thanks to you guys at home for watching as well. A reminder that our book, Behind the Lines, is available to order now online and is also available in all good bookstores. Thanks a million for those of you who came to our quiz on at Coppers at Wednesday. I'm still uh, recovering a little bit. But enjoy your weekend. Enjoy all the games. Thanks again to Air Sport. And we'll chat to you this time next week. All the best.